The FIA Karting European Championship heads to a new venue, Cremona, on the Angelo Bergamonti circuit, named after the great motorcycle racer of the 1960s. It's a brand new circuit for the sport, and this is the first international karting meeting on the track of any kind. The Academy Trophy is ready for its second weekend, and the KZ and KZ2 classes will crown a European champion each, with the intense Italian heat set to become a huge factor in the event. For the 164 drivers racing this weekend, it's a new experience, as the drivers all come into the meeting completely blind, with the track providing increased grip on the racing line and very little off it. Drivers are going to be tested more harshly than usual. Mistakes will clearly be punished, but the promise of victory will keep the competitors motivated all the way to the chequered flag. Let's ride with Paolo Ippolito for Kart Republic. Flat down the start-finish straight into a pair of very fast right-handers, keeping the kart firm at the apex. Head into the right-hand pair of corners and keep it very smooth. Then connect the cart to the outside, ready for turn five, and delicately balance the throttle on exit. Now the square left immediately into a square right, where the cart can easily snap away from you. Then along the back straight and heavy braking into the right-hand hairpin, past the pit lane entry and exit. Now a very tricky and punishing complex, a sequence of left-hand turns that really start to put pressure on the tires. Once the slowest hairpin is negotiated, you turn back to the right, Accelerate again through the next kink as the corner opens, then carry as much speed as possible through the final turn and return to the line. With tyre degradation and temperatures high, it's a tough circuit to master. It takes a certain type of character to race at this level, whether you are male or female, experienced or a rookie. A physical training routine that pushes you harder every day mental focus and agility that requires the patience of a saint, and a teamwork ethic that brings you closer to your mechanics and coaches. There's an old saying that attests that racing drivers should treat their body like a temple and have a mind like a monk. And never is it more true than at this level. It may be a solo discipline of sport, but it's worth remembering that it takes a really strong team of people to make you a champion, and you can't do it alone. For the academy drivers, there's almost as much work off track as there is on. Formula Medicine looks at many different areas of the sport, introducing the competitors to educational tools regarding nutrition, anti-doping, brain training and fitness. The program is going throughout all three rounds of the Academy Trophy. So in Genk, we already did the part where we were doing educational programs on nutrition for drivers. And here at um, Cremona, we're doing mental training. And when we go to Le Mans, we're going to be doing the athletic side. So it's a really 360 degree kind of educational program for these young drivers to try to give them that extra impulse, the extra push, the extra knowledge that they need to step up their level of competitivity. It's clear that the drivers are using these lessons to take the next step from developing racer to professional athlete. Drivers such as Charles Leclerc, George Russell and Esteban Ocon have all come from this platform to Formula One. So who knows what the future holds for our young stars. At the first round at Genk, the conditions favoured the Frenchman Arthur Dorisson, whose consistency on Saturday led to a controlled and strong drive on Sunday to clinch the first win of the season, ahead of William Goh of the Philippines and Guillaume Bouzard of Luxembourg. But the title fight is only just getting started. It became clear quite quickly that Dorisson would be unlikely to make it a double, as the contenders at the front in Cremona had changed. Through the heats, Matthias Orweiler of Colombia and Thibaut Ramakas of Belgium had been the most successful winners, with Buzar also scoring on Sunday morning. But with Ivo Besterda and Alexander Bogunovic also in the mix, there's every chance of a completely different podium in Italy. Orweiler would lead from pole position, as Buzar beside him was overtaken by Besterda, Ramakas and Mark Dubnitsky. The battles continued throughout the field, with drivers trying to get into a rhythm. But the opening lap would claim a couple of victims early on. 
Lockheel McGregor of New Zealand would end his first final of the year halfway round the lap with a spin. And local hero Riccardo Cirelli would suffer a disappointing walk home after a similar moment off track. Santino Panetta's brilliant start was undone after the Argentine ran wide in the final sector, but he moved back ahead of Caleb Gaffrara before the lap was over, as McGregor tried and failed to rejoin. Nicolas Roos dueled with Adrian Ferrer down the back straight, as the Spaniard won the duel for the time being. Luco Horton was about to lose out to Megamu Suzuki and then immediately to Hamza Alfayez, Aditya Wibowo and Mies Huben. Wibowo would then pass Alfayez as he set his sights on a charging drive through the field, Huben also moving ahead in unison. Ramakas made his bid for second and he couldn't pass Pesterda, which gave Buzar the line and the overtake up into third position. But as the Luxemburger showed his intentions for a podium finish, Horton was out of action and fed up with retiring on only lap five. Panetta began his comeback drive as he surged ahead of Dino Storescu of Romania, but would he be able to look after the tyres well enough to challenge for the podium? Timofey Mikulov of Malaysia wouldn't have to think about it any longer as he retired with technical problems. Kian Gauchi's exit was more dramatic. A spin on the home straight caused a mild scare. His cart was left abandoned on the circuit itself, but the drivers were able to take avoiding action. Struescu would then join the growing list of casualties as the marshals cleared the track. Huben was now battling with Wibowo and the young Turkish ace, Batty yielded him. And it was finally a frustrating end to a tough weekend for Genk winner Arthur Dorisson, who would now have to wait for Le Mans for another chance. Roos managed to take the position away from Dubnitsky as he made haste to climb his way up the order. But nobody could keep in touch with Orwella, who after a difficult weekend in Belgium, was in perfect, dominant form here. Behind him, Pesterda was working hard to defend from Buzar, who could take the lead of the standings if it stayed like this. Finland's Joel Pajola had dealt with William Go and was now passing Dubnitsky, who lost out to Go in the same breath. Buzar worked gradually to close in on Pesterda, and when he made his move, he made it count to gain second position and the lead in the driver's standings. As the Luxemburger made progress, sadly the two ladies that reached the final would end their races together. Chiara Batigue and Elise Rolfsen would tangle in the final sector. Sturescu recovered from his earlier demise, but it wouldn't last long as he parked up for good. Bruce and Gaffrara continued their battle right to the end of the race, as both drivers showed their flair with great overtakes and supreme defending. But up ahead, it was clear that Matthias Orwella had thrown himself into the title fight with a perfect weekend. The Colombian had soaked up all the pressure and not made a single mistake since time qualifying as he had gone from pole position to lead every lap of every heat and the final. Buzar grabbed the lead of the standings in second ahead of Besterda, who scored his first podium. Ramakas finished fourth ahead of Panetta and Roos, whilst Pajola would be seventh ahead of Bogunovic, Go and Gafrara. Besterda picked up where Maciek Gladysz left off last year to put Poland back on the podium. Buzar's consistency now makes him the Academy Trophy leader and he'll want to go one better in France. But the shy and quiet Mateus Orwella is now a contender for the crown and if he's fast again at Le Mans, he could be the first Colombian ever to win an FIA karting title. Today has been extremely incredible. I, I never thought that this would happen. Um, it started off great. Uh, warm up was fine. First heat of P1 of the day. And then the final, we just, I put my head down and tried to go every lap perfect. And at, at the end, it worked out. I think I have a good chance for France. I think I have a good chance for the title as well. But you never know with karting, so we'll have to see. So today was a great day because at the beginning I was only 12 and I managed to come back at the second for the final. Then poor start in the final, but I managed again to come back at second. For Le Mans should be okay because I know the track, 
I've been drawing there a lot of times, so it should be okay. Today was pretty good. I finished a uh, hit at uh, second po position. In the final, I started at um, third. Uh, I finished at uh, third, so I'm still in, the, in this posi position. And I'm so excited. And yeah. Tom Luyer was the dominant force in the season opener at Genk, and whilst he was unbelievably fast, five heat wins and second in the superheat, followed by an astonishing win in the final, was the perfect comeback after his horrific crash last season. He's stronger than ever and a very popular winner. But can he become champion, or will his rivals catch up in Cremona? The Biralart group have been on the pace from the outset on this new circuit, with Moritz Ebner and Alessio Pacini on the front row. But Tom Loyer only needs to stay where he is to become champion. So with the stage set for a close fight for victory, how will it all play out? And who will triumph in the ferocious Italian sun? Pacini blasted into the lead ahead of Ebner and Christian Bertuka in the early stages. But things had gone terribly wrong for Arvid Lindblad, whose dreams of becoming European champion had already fizzled out. CPB sport driver Tim Gerhards also had an unfortunate opening lap, and his podium aspirations were over in an instant. The Biralart trio remained in front, whilst Loyer was having to defend from Daniel Vassile to remain in fourth place. By the third lap, he was up to speed, and the Leclerc by Lennox driver made his way onto the podium by gaining third place. Incredibly, it only took him one more lap to close up on Christian Bertuka and then make a decisive overtake once more. That promoted him to second place with plenty of time to catch Puccini. Whilst Biralart had been strong all weekend, the only other chassis to keep the pace had been Sodicart, so Thomas Imborg and Arthur Carbonell sliced inside Vassile in a bid to maintain that performance. Lindblad had rejoined the field and was setting multiple fastest laps in a bid to catch the pack and show what might have been. Despite the tricky nature of the hot weather, the racers were on exceptional behaviour and driving standards were higher than usual. By lap 16, Loyer was finally close enough to make a move and he didn't hesitate. The Frenchman was now in the lead at last and Bertuka had crept into second place too but the leader was now on course to take both final wins over the season in 2022. After a sensational qualifying effort, Gerhards would retire in Cremona in disappointing fashion. And he was soon joined by angry teammate Carbonell, who had his own views on the matter. Michael Rossiner came unstuck battling with Oscar Target and Michael Paparo but the TV cart driver kept his engine running and rejoined. Tim Throger was doing his best to keep the Marinello dream alive, with his teammate David Trevelov now unable to become champion. And Alex Marigliano had pushed his Drago Corsa chassis as far as it could go. Down in 16th, there was a monumental train of drivers, which kept Danilo Albanese out of contention after only just scraping into the final. But there were no such stresses in the lead as Tom Loyer not only won the race in Cremona in majestic fashion, but became the only driver in recent history to win both European finals. The Charles Leclerc chassis had won a European title for the second time in three years, and Loyer had bounced back from a devastating accident over a year before. And of all the people to celebrate with him on the victory lap, who better than his twin brother, Gabin? Bertuka and Pacini shared his podium joy, whilst Imborg eventually eclipsed Ebner for the top five. Vassile came home ahead of Jean Riette, Michael Paparo, the impressive novice Oscar Target, and the vanquished David Trevelov. Pacini was perfectly satisfied with a podium to round out the season, and it looks like he could be a title contender himself in 2023. Bertuka finally seems to have thrown his bad luck over his shoulder and is scoring the results he richly deserves. 
But nobody could deny Tom Loyer as a worthy champion after a tough rehabilitation and an exceptional effort. Nobody could match him in 2022, and now he's the clear favorite to win the World Cup on home soil at Le Mans in September. It was a great weekend all throughout, and to win this race after the recovery from last year is so satisfying. It's a team effort, so I'm very grateful. I'm quite confident. We won the two European races, so it's pretty good now for us to win the World Cup. I think it went really good and the final I started P4 and I was confident with the chassis so I just wait the right moment to come up to P2 and uh, do my race with my pace, stay behind Tom and arrive P2. I feel really confident, I always been competitive since Gang was my first race and uh, we will see, everything can happen. We were all fast, for sure the track condition was not easy because there was a lot of rubber on track and from the first day it was really hard to find a good setup and to find a good pace to, to do a race of 25 laps. I want to win the race but I mean I'm, I'm still happy with the, with the result because I also closing uh, in P3 in the championship so I think that's that's not bad for, for the next race in Le Mans. We will see what, what happens there. I'm happy because we we all were there with a bit of RTM. Was, was we were quite strong on track, so I'm confident for the next race. Just the relationship that Tom has created with the team, with myself, it really meant a lot, and it and it it was one to the heart for me, and I think to everybody in the team um, that Tom took the championship. Uh, not only are we happy for Tom, but for the whole of the Birrell Arts and the TM group. Uh, it's an outstanding day. Um, and I mean, yeah, hopefully we can have more races like this. Y you can never really know what's, what's going to happen. Uh, we can only prepare ourselves for any kind of condition. We will obviously go testing and make sure that we find a good balance uh, and anticipate what will come for the race. In the Premier KZ category, Belgium was a terrific spectacle, completely dominated by Emilion Denner and the Sodicart team. But with pressure from Italian stars Paolo Ippolito and Matteo Vigano, there's no chance of easing off the throttle, as in KZ, anything can happen. It's clear that Sodicart have a winning chassis, but do they have a champion in their awning when everything is so close? It's Pedro Hiltbrand that showed up in style during the heats, and with Senna van Walstein equally as quick and the title contenders struggling, there's an unbelievable eight drivers who could potentially become champion today. Last time that happened, there was chaos at Sarno in 2019. So will this battle be tame or ferocious? At the start, van Walstein and Ippolito jumped ahead of the Birolart of Hiltbrand, who would drift wide and lose several places. Van Walstein was now leading and hoping to give Sodicar two wins in a row. Vigano was still a title contender, but he would have to catch and pass Ippolito to do so, so Valtonen would be an easy target to start the attack. Denner was desperate and impetuous as he dived inside Francesco Salenta at the hairpin. He was out of contention and he needed a comeback drive. Then came a surprise, as former world champion Jeremy Iglesias elected to wave Pedro Hiltbrand through. A friendly gesture or an intriguing tactic? We still don't know the answer. Denner was still making late braking moves as he surged ahead of Stan Pex, but took a tarpon and found the gap to pass them both as Lorenzo Travazanuto cleared Pex. Once again, the laps ticked down and the drivers realized that the race would be decided by who managed their tires best. Van Walstein was doing a masterful job of that and was on course for his maiden KZ win. Matteo Segreve performed a four-wheel drift to pass Quentin Boria, who tried to retaliate. They banged wheels, allowing Louis Speck and Victor Gustafsson the chance to move ahead. It turned out that the contact had damaged Boria's car beyond repair, and he was out. 
Ippolito was keeping his Kart Republic in second place ahead of Simo Pohaka. If he continued there, he would become European champion, a perfect tonic after the agony of Lonato two years ago. Davide Fore made his move on Marin Kramers, but post-race, he would be demoted to last for a technical infringement. Denner's chances of the title ended dramatically after Stan Pex pirouetted over the top of him. Both men were out and Denner's championship win was gone. The Frenchman was devastated. Then Puhaka spun out of third place, a victim of the changing grip levels off the racing line. So as he returned to the pits, Ippolito and Vigano were back on the podium again. But try as he might, Vigano just couldn't catch the Kart Republic, and not for the first time, he would be left painfully close to becoming champion without the ultimate reward. And Valtanen and Hiltbrand would pressure him all the way, just in case a spot on the podium became available. Van Marstein, however, was about to clinch his first KZ win on only his second attempt, and with it, he would seal third place in the standings. But despite not taking a win over the two weekends, a pair of second places in the finals were enough to give Paolo Ippolito a chance to set the record straight after years of hardship. So the Dutchman came through to win and to set up a world championship attack at Le Mans, which could be Sodicart's first ever in KZ in their homeland. But behind him, the glory belonged to the new European champion, Paolo Ippolito who becomes the 20th Italian to win the title since its inception back in 1972. A very popular win by a very popular racer. Vigano joined the two victors on the podium with Valtanen, Hiltbrand and Iglesias in the top six. The Tony Kart trio of Noah Millel, Tukatarpanen and Lorenzo Camplese were joined in the top ten by Lorenzo Travazanuto. Vigano appeared philosophical in defeat, and in his fourth year in KZ, he'll be hoping that Le Mans is finally the chance to become a champion. Ippolito wipes away the memories from the past to take his rightful place in the FIA Karting Hall of Fame as a European champion. And Senna van Walstein emerges as the new Netherlands warrior in KZ. And with Le Mans only two and a half months away, he could join Marijn Kramers, Jorrit Pex and Max Verstappen as a Dutch world champion. Um, yeah, of course, coming in today, yeah, we were, we were lacking a bit of pace yesterday, so we know it was going to be difficult. But I think, yeah, most important thing was the start, and we knew that before the race. So, yeah, the start was good. I uh, was a bit lucky with Pedro, he didn't come off the line very well. So, yeah, that made everything a little bit more easy for me. And, yeah, in the race, the car felt amazing, like we haven't been there so far this week. And, yeah, that no, was good. We kept doing the laps together, and, yeah, and, yeah we managed to win it. Yeah, for sure. I feel really good and for me it's the first European Championship, so uh, it's something also new, um, something special because it's not easy to gain this kind of uh, result, uh, especially at this level that is really high. I'm really happy and everything was perfect during uh, this weekend. To be fair, we didn't expect to struggle so much Thursday and Friday. After qualifying, to be fair, the the minimum goal was the to manage to uh, arrive to uh, get to the podium because after the P14 was for me really hard trying to recover. To, to be fair, I'm quite happy for for the for the end of this how it ended this championship, how it how it started uh, the weekend, and I have to thanks uh, Jordan and all the team uh, to uh, find the the good setup for uh, for recovery after Friday. So we come here the beginning of the weekend trying to win the European Championship with uh, with Denner but uh, it was a very difficult challenge challenging uh, week and um, we worked very hard with both drivers and were able to stand on the top step again so yeah to win in Genk with one driver and win Cremona with another so a little bit disappointed to win the, for the team to win two races and not be champion but We'll push hard for the World Championship, that's for sure. The heat and excitement at Cremona rounded off a phenomenal European Championship campaign in KZ and KZ2. 
Matthias Orwela has joined the Academy Trophy title race with a dominant display. It'll conclude in September at Le Mans with an incredible showdown. And Tom Luyer and Paolo Ippolito have become triumphant legends after 18 months of adversity. So with two heroes crowned, we look forward to awarding the OK and OK Junior European titles in three weeks' time down the road at Franciacorta. So until then, we'll let Van Wallstein enjoy his winning moment and Luyer and Ippolito to soak up the glory as 2022 European champions.